So we're gonna leave. We're gonna leave behind marriage for love. The host asks for something, a tale, somewhat of love, and the squire uh, delivers. In his tale, women are virtuous because love is treated as courtly. With the falcon's tail, for example, inside of this uh, tale, this unfinished tale, we get an amorous confession that reveals the falseness of men. Now, we've seen this false lover topos before. So deep in grain he dyed his colors, right as a serpent hit him under floors. The lover's falseness is expressed through colors and flowers. In other words, figures of rhetoric to conceal the truth. We've already seen in the clerk's tale the issue of rhetoric, but in the context of the high style as representative of Petrarch's sweet rhetoric. Both the squire's tale and the Franklin's tale are explicitly concerned with the writing of poetry as well. At the very beginning, the squire's unfinished story of Canacy, her father, Genghis Khan, the brass horse, which is why we're here. These are our modern brass horses. There's one landing right now. The mirror, the sword, the ring, the talking birds, the grieving falcon. In all of this, the squire has trouble describing Canisse's beauty. He evokes the inexpressibility topos that shows that language has limits. This is, this is a feature of love poetry, which merges as well with the modesty topos or the dullness topos, since it also relates to his inability to compose in English. A doctor had this worthy king also, that youngest was in Hichta Canase, but for to tell you all her beauté, it lieth not in my tongue, nine my cunning. I dare not undertake so high a thing. Mine English ache is insufficient. It must been a rhetor excellent that could his colors longing for that art, if he should her describe in every part. I am none such. I must speak as I can. The word high makes you think of what? The high style, right? Petrarch's style in the clerk's tale. The problem is that the style worthy of her, and we're thinking of decorum now, is not possible because of his lack of abilities. It requires a better rhetor. This is a late 14th and 50th century term for poet. A rhetorician armed with the colors or figures of rhetoric. Those will be in order and he's just not one of them. Number five. In romances like Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, the sudden appearance of a knight functions as a disruption to the normal linguistic discourse. They appear like adventures. And like beauty, language usually falters. But here the squire, and as we've seen this as well in the clerk's tale, and other tales under the influence of the rhetorical arts of descriptio, as prescribed, as we saw previously by Matthew of Vendome, the eloquence of a character is as important as their physical features. So how eloquent is the knight? The strange knich that came thus suddenly, uh, all armed save his head full richly, saluteth king and queen and lord as all by order as they sit in the hall with so high reverence and obeisance, as well in speech as in countenance, that Gawain with his old courtesia, though he were coming again out of Feria, ne could him not amend with a word. We're made to think of Sir Gowan the Green Knight. That's obvious because of the reference to Gawain. A knight, 
appears in a court clad in green and gold who threatens the linguistic order that enforces a certain Arthurian narrative stability. That's Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Now, in the literary tradition, in the prose romance tradition, and even in Chrétien de Troy, Gawain's eloquence always conceals an element of self-deception. So, what happens when the knight speaks? The knight, the knight, is equal to Gawain. And this is how he speaks. And after this, before in the high board, that's at the table where they're eating, he with a manly voice saith his message, after the form used in his langage, without envies of syllable or of letter. And for his tale should seem the better, according to his words was his cheer, as teacheth art of speech him that it leer. All be that I cannot sown his style, ne cannot climb in over so high a style, yet say I this as to come in a tent, Thus much amounteth all that ever he meant, if it so be that I have it in mind. There's perfect harmony, an accord between his words and his cheer. The gloss says expression, but it's not fully clear. It's his facial expressions, right? How he displays himself, the gestures that indicate the content of his act, his intentions, his spirit of mind. There is an accord between his words and his physical characteristics. And this, the squire says, is taught by the art of speech, as taught by those who learn it. Now, you already know what that means. That's decorum. And that rhetorical style appropriate to his physical bearing and spiritual frame of mind is the high style. The same style praised by the clerk when thinking of Petrarch. But there's a joke here too associated with the modesty topos and this high style. I'll be that I cannot sown his style, nor cannot climb an over so high a style. The squire cannot climb over so high a style. This is a joke. Styles are sort of steps built into a wall that allow you to, or a fence that allow you to climb over a wall of fence, right? If you travel in England, you'll see styles are everywhere when you're taking a walk in the countryside. Those are examples of 17th century styles. So style as steps built into a wall or over a wall or over a fence and style as a literary rhetorical um, approach to ornament, not to ornamentation, but to ornatus is a pun here. The use of words that sound alike but differ in meaning. There's also an agricultural metaphor here too that you remember from the knight's tale, right? Because you're sowing the field and the field is not just the field of literature or the field of thought or the field of study, it's also the page. We saw this in Isidore of Seville as well, where the versus is not only the furrow that you place seeds in, it's also the line of poetry. So he cannot climb over so high a style. You get it now, right? And why can't he? What's the nature of this knight's high style? His form of language is without... Without in vis of syllable or of letter. In other words, it's perfectly metrical. Since the squire is so conscious of meter's purpose in eloquence, I think it would be worth looking at Middle English meter. In the next episode, let's learn how to scan Chaucer. Alright guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.